this week, we meet the activists sabotaging SUVs. What gives you the right to interfere with their property? Hello and welcome to the show. This week we're looking at our ever-growing appetite for these bigger, chunkier vehicles, the so-called SUVs. Last year these models made up 60% of new car sales in the UK and that's causing headaches over emissions, road space and even safety. And the electric versions aren't immune from the criticism either. Also on the show... Is what's coming into here from the sewage works, well, in quality terms, a little bit like a fart. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good analogy. Uh, yes, it is. Powered by poo, we hear about how sewage waste is warming some homes. A new era of gas or just playing politics in an election year. We break down what actually changed in energy policy this week. And weird creatures from the deep. Scientists in New Zealand are baffled after discovering more than a hundred new marine species. But first, loved by consumers but hated by environmental activists, are these bigger cars a growing issue? Late at night in London's exclusive Knightsbridge, activists are letting down the tyres of SUVs. They then put a note in the window. It reads, your gas guzzler kills. The group are called the Tire Extinguishers and they've become notorious in cities around the world. These activists agreed to speak to us if we protected their identity, but they say their actions are justified. Why do you think it's right to target these bigger 4x4 vehicles? Because, quite simply, they're unsafe. They are climate wrecking and, and, and they're just they're huge and they're not acceptable to have in London. People may have chosen these vehicles for their own lifestyle, for their own desires. What gives you the right to interfere with their property? It's a really interesting question. What gives them the right to impact well, I'm on... You what gives you the right to interfere with their property? Yeah, but I'm asking what gives them the right to impact on everyone's air that they're breathing? You know, where, where does the right end? Well, I still don't feel I got from you an answer of what gives you the right to interfere with someone's property. If you don't mind me answering that question. I do. I, when you say a right, is it perhaps a responsibility rather than a right? The auto industry is showing no responsibility for the massive cars that they're marketing and advertising at people. So we're simply saying to these owners, you take responsibility. Don't buy cars like this. These activists have a mountain to climb to make a dent in our desire for bigger, more powerful cars. Last year, 60% of all new vehicles sold in the UK were SUVs, up from 50% in 2021. So what's behind our insatiable appetite for chunky vehicles with off-road styling? The industry says cars are getting bigger because they're getting safer. And despite being more expensive to run, customers seem to have embraced them. Tell me, what do you like first of all about this car? With the size of it uh -huh. and the comfort. I suffer with arthritis and the comfort in the car and I don't feel any road bumps or anything like that. I like it because it's got a high driving position, gives a better view. All round. Actually, I do like being elevated above because we went back down to a lower estate car. I missed being at this height. Yeah. I know it's, I don't know what it says for the other people in the road, poor things that can't see, but it does give you it, lovely visibility. I don't like, for example, to drive the small cars on a, on the road. I don't like it because I am scared. But the big one is easy to, to drive. It, it makes yeah. you feel safe? Make me safe, yes. But the fact that these vehicles tend to be bigger and heavier threatens our climate targets, according to this green transport think tank. Government's own advisors on climate change, the Climate Change Committee, have said that the, the trend towards larger cars is effectively offsetting the CO2 savings we're getting from increased efficiency of engines. So, again, when you consider that this is our largest emitting sector of transport, that is a serious problem. And it's not just emissions. Some studies suggest larger cars are more likely to kill pedestrians than standard models. Being bigger, they also occupy more road space and parking bays, meaning cities are starting to crack down. 
Paris recently tripled parking costs on SUVs and parts of London have hiked charges too. It is the higher the polluter, the more you pay. You would not expect to, to, to just have people polluting. If you're drinking dirty water, you say no. Um, why should we have dirty air, bad air, you know? Some drivers, like me, have taken to electric cars to lower our carbon emissions, but they still cause air pollution through tyre and brake wear, and they're heavy. This one is nearly two tonnes. So they too are not immune to the anger or actions of the tyre extinguishers. We are seeing a, a new breed of electric 4x4s coming out. Do you target them as well? Absolutely, and there's a, usually there's a kickback against that. People will get very, very cross. They've been mugged by the advertising and marketing people into thinking they're doing the right thing, when in fact they're causing massive problems, both in terms of pollution, in terms of climate and in terms of safety. The actions of activists like these will likely infuriate many. But despite the risk of being targeted or having to pay higher taxes or parking charges, when it comes to our desire for cars, many of us continue to believe that big is beautiful. Now, the government's plans for new gas power stations made headlines this week, but there was also lots of detail about how a future energy system might operate, which got much less coverage. Well, to break this all down and find out what, if anything, has really changed, I'm joined by Emma Pinchbeck from Energy UK, the trade body representing the energy industry. First of all, on those new gas power stations, do you think they'll actually be built, or is this more about politics? I think when you looked at the detail, not much has changed our expectations about what the future energy system would be, which is about 75% renewables-ish, and then the rest made up of nuclear, some abated gas, which means hydrogen or carbon capture, and then 1% or less of unabated, just for if we need it on the system for emergencies. So if not much is changing, why make this big announcement? I'm not a politician, but I hear there's a general election on, so I think a lot of policies are being pitched a particular way. We went and looked straight at the detail, and the detail is consistent with what the Committee on Climate Change say and what we as an energy sector need to keep the lights on and to make sure we've got green power. So, I mean, you don't really want to say it, but you're kind of agreeing there's a bit of politics being played here. Yeah, I think there's always politics played on energy. Sometimes that's unhelpful for us in the sector. What we really need is like long-term clear signals from government. But we also understand there's a general election on, so we plan to ride out the messages for the next 12 months and then look really into the detail of the documents. What drove the need for this, they said, was that, you know, the danger of still cloudy days in the winter when we need energy and renewables aren't delivering. I thought we were going to try and make up that by building up storage. What's happened there? We are going to build up storage. So one of the changes being made to the capacity market, which is this big auction that we procure gas and, and generation in to keep the lights on, is to allow alternate forms of generation to come through. So long duration energy storage, that's energy storage that can stay on for days or even weeks at a time, as well as things like gas with hydrogen or carbon capture in. So a mix of technologies to provide that security. There is a whole set of policies on energy storage particularly that we're still waiting for and we'd really like the government to bring forward. So a bit inadequate on energy storage? Not inadequate, but more still to do. The other thing they talked about was something called sort of zoning electricity, making it more zonal. What does that mean? At the moment in the UK we have a single price for the whole of the country. This proposal would break the country into regions and you would pay a price that's different depending on how much generation you have, how constrained the local grid is. So, so what it could mean for consumers is if you're in an area with lots of renewables, you have a lower electricity price. So could it mean that it encourages people to have wind turbines nearer them? Does it kind of undermine NIMBYism a bit? It's one thing that it might do. And to be honest, when you change the market as radically as this might, it's going to take some time to do it. So the important thing is we'd like the timetable. Is this going to be 2025 or 2030? And that's important because the mix of technologies you have on the system then changes what the prices might be in each region and the impacts on people and the industry. And, and talking about the electricity market, I remember a, a couple of years ago there was talk about how we should be trying to decouple the price of electricity from gas. Because yes. The war in Ukraine made gas very expensive and people were saying, hang on, wind turbines are spinning out there, making it pretty cheaply. How come we can't get our electricity cheaply? What's happened there? So that specific proposal has been ruled out, but all of the proposals in this new market design are basically about trying to provide better services for customers 
more certainty for the industry and a market that looks a bit more like the modern technologies that we'll have on the grid. When you take the suite of all these measures, can you say if there's any impact on our bills? The most important thing to understand is this is going to take time. So the best thing we can do for bills in the short term is try and reduce our demand for gas by putting more renewables on the system, more onshore wind, more solar, and then in people's homes, insulation, electric heating, smart meters, these cleaner modern technologies that we are fully in control of in this country. It's interesting you say that because as your, as your trade body, you represent you know, gas generators as well. You're yeah. across the whole thing, but yeah. you are convinced that to bring prices down, we need to lean more into renewables, less into gas. The energy sector is completely committed to the net zero transition. Part of that is because we're people that care about the environment. We have families, you know, we have children, we think about the future. Most of it, if I'm honest, is that the economics of the energy transition are firmly in favour of renewables, electrification and these modern technologies. We basically think that will enable us to offer better services at lower prices to British customers. Emma Pinchbeck, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, sticking with energy, I've been given the glamorous assignment of coming to the Mogden Sewage Treatment Plant in West London. Not necessarily the kind of place you'd expect to find a source of renewable power. But here, poo power is now heating some local homes. Let's go and see how it's done. A site like this, Mogden Sewage Treatment Works, treats the waste of over 2 million people. So There's over a billion litres per day. And as part of that process, uh, we settle out organic matter, which we call raw sludge. Really calorific. With that raw sludge, we uh, blend, thicken, pasteurise, and then digest it. That's essentially putting it into stomachs where it can digest to produce biogas. Now, we might think of what leaves us as, as a waste product, not having much calorific value. Either. Why didn't we take it out? But, but there, is, there is energy there? Absolutely. We like to call it sort of poo power on this site. Um, what we consume and what we eat obviously fuels our bodies, but it also has calorific material that is uh, kept within that matter and is flushed down the loos. That energy is biogas, methane mixed with CO2 and other impurities. For years it's been burnt to make energy on site, but now it's been cleaned up for home use. But recently we've uh, constructed a biomethane plant or a gas to grid plant, which takes some of that gas, uprates or improves its quality so it's good enough to be injected directly into the domestic gas grid. Why do you think it's important to be making energy from waste? Well, the, the, the fundamental thing is with sewage, we're going to be settling out that organic matter, whatever happens. So it's much better to do something useful with it. And biomethane is just another tool in the arsenal for us to, to utilise that gas, which is naturally produced in an effective manner. And the amount of energy coming from the sewer varies according to what we eat. The fattier foods come from uh, certain cuisines, uh, different demographics, so you can really tell a lot about the people uh, that surround you. Um, but also, yeah, uh, we have variations in what we call load throughout the year and throughout the day, um, ranging to things like Christmas, where after two or three days, we like to say the lights flicker a little bit more because of the calorific. So it is really in. true that over Christmas, you'll get more calorific value from we, what we comes can in do. Here. It is variable, uh, variable across the entirety of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But high days and holidays when people are eating rich food yeah. means more energy for you. More poo power for us, yeah. <laughs> and this is where they take that gas from the poo and clean it up to make it suitable for the grid. So the heart of the plant in here is the membrane separation units. The membrane separation units. These, these membranes strip out the carbon dioxide and leave just methane into the gas that goes off to the gas grid. A little bit schoolboyish, but kind of calling it like it is, is what's coming into here from the sewage works, well, in quality terms, a little bit like a fart. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good analogy. Uh, yes, it is, because essentially, uh, biogas comes from a cow's stomach, or, or can be digested by a cow's stomach, and when they discharge the contents of a cow's stomach, you do get the yeah. fart, and that's the biogas that we're treating here. So it's today. a bit like the human equivalent of that. It is, I'm afraid. Uh, and where does it actually go out to the grid? So it goes out to the grid through this unit here this have wider potential not just here if so how big it has significant potential across the country we're currently working with Yorkshire Water and Thames Water and the other water companies to convert their biogas into biomethane across the networks it's generally held consensus that 20% is easily achievable but to meet net zero targets we're meant to move away from gas is this just a way of keeping homes attached to the gas pipe now, before going to a break, I just want to bring you some pictures sent to us by the Scottish Wildlife Trust. It shows the early return of a female osprey to the Loch of Lowes in Perthshire for her fifth breeding season in Scotland. 
She's seen preparing the nest before her male partner returns too. The birds migrate to West Africa, Spain and Portugal for the winter. Previously driven to extinction in the UK, they've now recovered since the 1960s and now around 300 breeding pairs return to Britain each summer. We're off to a break now, but when we come back, how California's giant sequoia trees, often known as giant redwoods, are thriving in Britain and absorbing carbon in the process. Welcome back to the show and to Redwood Grove at Kew Gardens in London. I'm here because a report out this week showed that these giants are not just surviving, but thriving in the UK, even though they're more commonly known and native to California. And I'm with Professor Matt Disney, who's done the work. Matt, why are you leaning against this one? Uh, <laughs> well, it's one of our giant redwoods that's thriving here in the UK. This is a bit of a baby one, really. Um, I don't know exactly how old this one is, but I'm guessing probably not more than about 30, 40 years old. Some of the ones around us that we're going to take a look at are a lot older. Yeah. Forgive me for looking at this a little disappointed. It's not quite living up to its name, the not giant. Yeah, yet. Give it another thousand years yeah. and it will. Now, why are they doing so well in the UK and how do the numbers compare to California? They're doing, we think they're doing very well because the climate here, as people will be unsurprised to find out, is pretty damp. Um, <laughs> it's relatively cool compared to the kind of Sierra the mountains in, in California. So it seems as if the climate here is actually arguably better for them than it is in California. And that's particularly true as climate changes and the rainfall gets more sporadic there and particularly as things like devastating fires come through because that's what really, really hurts these things. And just give me the numbers, how many in the UK? Well, the estimates are that there are about half a million redwoods in the UK. So I should say that that includes a couple of different species. So we have these giant redwoods here, and then there's the very closely related, also California native, the coastal redwood, of which we have a particularly nice example yeah. over there. Which is actually bigger than the giant redwoods it around is, it. It's, it's very impressive. The coastal redwoods hold the record for being the tallest trees on Earth. So the tallest tree on Earth is about 115 metres. It's a tree called Hyperion. Uh, and that is a coastal redwood, but they're not the most massive trees. That is held, that title's held by these. So, so. for bulk, giant, for height, coastal. Exactly. But they're all absolutely awesome. And, but the coastals are doing well in UK the as well? The coastals seem to be doing well. We ha haven't looked at those so closely. We focus mainly mm. on these ones because there are a lot more of these in the UK than there are um, the coastal ones. So I gather, you know, quite a few specimens were brought over in the mm -hmm. Victorian era. Have they just spread out from then? No, they haven't. Not at least naturally, because as far as we know, they don't germinate naturally here in the UK. So all the trees that exist in the UK have been planted by people. And so although they are kind of dotted around all over the place, every single one of those has been planted. Now, you mentioned fire. How do they cope with fire as trees? So they have this extraordinarily thick bark. So if you, you know, give that thing a good punch. I'm not going to hurt myself. No, 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 no. Oh, no. So you feel how spongy it is. Yeah. So that, um, that bark is, is centimetres thick and on really, really big trees, it can be you know, tens and tens of centimetres thick, you know, half a metre thick. And that bark is very, very resistant to fire. The changing climate in California is leading to more severe and more frequent severe fires. Mm. And that's what's really threatening them in their native range. So there's about 80,000 of these things left and 20% of them were lost in a single fire a couple of years ago. Wow, that's in California, 20% of the yeah. Well, let's just move away from the bit to get an idea of some of the bulk of them. And tell me, how do these fit into our sort of carbon storage story? Because a lot of people think, you know, that's one of the good things about growing trees, sucking up more carbon. Yeah, of course, and these trees are very effective at doing that. In, again, the kind of the really big old ones, they're some of the biggest carbon stores per tree of any tree species in the world, and they grow really, really fast. So long-lived, fast-growing, big, mass that all adds up to a lot of carbon. So one of the questions that arises are they any good for wildlife because as a non-native that's not always the best? That's a very important question but it's not something that we've actually looked at at this initial stage but it's something we really really need to and I'm very interested in trying to find out. So my feeling is that there is going to be uh, you know a yeah. biodiversity benefit to these trees but we need to look at that much more carefully. Thanks very much indeed Matt and I like you just love being amongst these trees. Well we're going from up on high to deep down under to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia which is is currently experiencing an extraordinary coral bleaching event due to really high temperatures. It follows other mass bleaching events in the northern hemisphere in places like Florida during the 2023 summer. The exceptional heat we've experienced globally in the last year or so has been beyond 1.5 degrees for the first time. 
Scientists believe that passing 1.5 degrees of warming on a consistent basis would mean that 99% of reefs will be lost. Australia's Environment Minister shared this online. We know that we need to give our beautiful reef the best chance of survival for the plants and animals that call it home, for the 64,000 people whose livelihoods depend on reef tourism. And that's exactly what we do. Climate change is the biggest risk, not just to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but also to coral reefs around the world. And um, that's why we've legislated a pathway to net zero by 2050. It's why we're working hard to reduce carbon emissions in Australia, do our part in the global effort to reduce carbon emissions. Critics of the Australian government, however, do point out its continued support for coal mining. Sticking in that part of the world, 100 new species have just been discovered off the coast of New Zealand. We've taken a look at some of the weird and wonderful discoveries. I wasn't expecting that we'd find new species of fish. It looks like we have three new species of eel pouts from the deep, deep sea in the Bounty Trough. We've probably got dozens of new species of mollusks, marine snails. We also have new species of corals. We've even got at least one creature which we're not really sure what it is. So um, a whole variety of different groups of animals. We also collected footage from our deep toed imaging system camera, over 17 hours of video and 6,000 images of animals living in their natural habitat on the seafloor. And this will be really amazing. We got glimpses of species at depths that we didn't know they occurred, and also species from geographically extending the range of where they've come from. That is it for this week. Remember, you can catch up on all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app, or by scanning the QR code that's on your screen right now. Goodbye, see you next week. I'm off for a little walk around queue.